Where and when do New Year's resolutions originate? Is the crucifixion foretold by King David? And what can our forefather Jacob teach us about true happiness in life? This is Rabbi Yossi Madvig, and you're listening to Jews Did It First. Welcome back for another week of Jews Did It First. Hope you enjoyed last week's special holiday episode. And wouldn't you know it, there's another big holiday, New Year's Day, coming up this Monday. You know, it's interesting that two of the biggest non-Jewish holidays, Christmas and New Year's, makes a big deal about the night before. It's a very Jewish idea. This isn't really the topic for today, but um, I'll throw it in as a freebie so you can get a double dose of Jews did it first. In the beginning of the Bible, in the creation narrative, we read there was evening, there was morning, day one. And likewise with the other days, there was evening, there was morning, day two, etc. And from here, we derive the concept that the day begins at sundown, not the arbitrary 12 midnight. Right? The Jewish calendar is all about cosmic change, not random man-made hours on a clock. Uh, and the Jewish calendar is maybe something we can delve into in another episode. But because the day starts at night, some of the major celebrations and the inauguration of each holiday happens during the night preceding the day of the holiday. This is especially true for something like Hanukkah, which we just passed. Uh, the main celebrations is at night, like candles and so on. Uh, similarly, by Passover, the main observance, the Passover Seder, takes place specifically at night. Uh, and in fact, the commandment, the mitzvah of eating matzah, really the main observance, the main application of that mitzvah is on the night of Passover. So we see that celebrating the evening before, right, uh, is uh, definitely something that we can credibly claim Jews did it first. But let's get to the main topic of this week's episode, and that is New Year's resolutions. Now, in the past, uh, many cultures marked their calendars by the beginning of their empire or the ascension of a particular ruler to power. Uh, the Bible even makes reference to those sorts of dating systems. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that historical dating can be kind of tricky. Uh, it also affects the people's conception of the significance of that anniversary. It may be celebrated, it may not be celebrated, um, but there wouldn't necessarily be any inner meaning behind it, per se. Um, and many other cultures would have it around some uh, significant event of the year, the coming of spring or something like that. Uh, and, and there were many cultures uh, that did have religious ties and more inner meaning to their to their New Year's. Um, but, uh, you know, it seems really, in our culture anyway, um, that when, uh, only when Christmas started picking up steam as a significant religious celebration uh, around this time of year, did this idea of making a resolution to better yourself in the coming year become a widespread practice. Um, now, the first recorded mention of New Year's resolutions uh, I could find actually did not start with the Jewish people, interestingly enough. But before I get there, um, I want to talk about things that happened around the same time. So, uh, for instance, you have the ancient Egyptians. Okay, Now, their New Year's ce celebrations, they were before, but I couldn't find any um, mention of resolutions per se. There was a lot of frivolity, a lot of drinking, a lot of uh, illicit uh, male-female interactions, um, and probably uh, not just male-female interactions as well. A lot of, uh, you know, almost like a Mardi Gras type atmosphere. Um, but no real mention of a deep inner meaning. Uh, so, they, so a lot of ways they celebrated kind of like we do in our culture today. Um, now, to col another culture, uh, which actually started around the same time as the Jewish people, uh, was the ancient Chinese. Uh, there is, you know, some overlap there as far as when they started about 3,000 years ago, a little over 3,000 years ago, just like when we were given the Torah. And 
there, they do have this concept of resolutions. Um, and likewise, when I remember, like I said, even before the Jewish people, the ancient Babylonians, and the Babylonian people have different segments of their history. You have the early Babylonians or the ancient Babylonians or something like that. You have the, the middle and then you have the late Babylonians. Um, but even the, the early, the ancient Babylonians had this holiday of Akitu, which was their new year. And it lasted several days. Um, and their resolutions, much like the Chinese resolutions, uh, were mostly about the past. You know, it was basically this concept of, I'm going to pay off all my debts, I'm going to return everything that I borrowed, um, I'm going to uh, apologize to that guy who I said had a big nose, you know, whatever whatever it was. It was always about fixing up things that you did in the past. Um, now, could there be, you know, the occasional person that did say, I'm going to do X in the this coming year to be a better person? Yeah, could be, could be. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the bulk of the uh, the research that I found. Now, I will say, I'm not exactly a, an historian, uh, and I don't uh, claim to be as such, um, just the rabbi. And uh, yes, I have a slant. I'm trying to make it so Jews did it first. So, um, but the idea that we have uh, as a secular society of making these resolutions uh, are uh, to be better people, either um, you know, in a secular sense, not necessarily in a more um, spiritual sense, although those resolutions exist as well. But you know, the biggest ones every, every year are I'm going to exercise more, or I'm going to uh, uh, lose weight and diet and all these kinds of things. We're bettering ourselves physically. Um, or between man and man, oh, I'm going to be nicer to people, uh, I'm not going to be such a jerk, whatever it is. Um, but, uh, so that concept of bettering ourselves, that kind of resolution, that happens as the Jewish people leave Egypt. Uh, they're told to celebrate the new civil year in two significant ways. Rosh Hashanah, which is the actual day of the new year, and Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Uh, this is a 10-day period of time. Rosh Hashanah is the first of the month of Tishrei, and Yom Kippur is the 10th of the month of Tishrei. And that's a time of judgment, not just for Jews, but the whole world. And so therefore, uh, it's a crucial part of observing the new year on the Jewish calendar, to A, yes, reflect on the past year, recognize our shortcomings. Um, that's certainly part of it. And B, to resolve to better ourselves in the coming year. It's a time to make resolutions, to do more mitzvot, to become closer to God, give more charity, and so on. Um, and like I said, now that New Year's has become more secular, uh, it seems that the resolutions tend to be more secular as well. But regardless, we can say here that when it comes to the basic idea of a New Year's resolution for bettering ourselves in the future, Jews did it first. And now, the counter missionary. I'm not sure how many count, more counter-missionary segments we're going to be doing. Um, <clears throat> pretty soon, I'll, I think I'll switch it up and do something else for the middle segment. Uh, my wife really wants me to do uh, the Torah stance on some controversial issues. Let me know what you think. I, I'd like to hear. Uh, you know, you can send me an email at uh, jewishoswego at gmail.com, or you can comment on the Facebook page, Jews Did It First, you know contact me. Um, if you happen to have my phone number, you can shoot me a text. Um, find me on Facebook, whatever it is. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Maybe there's a, a segment you'd like to, uh, uh, a theme that you'd like to see, uh, or hear, I guess, in this case. Um, anyway, continuing in our counter-missionary claims, again, this is not a slap at the Christian community as a whole. This is uh, to contradict the narrative that specifically Christian missionaries, those out to missionize to the Jewish people to use their, uh, to use, sorry, our own Bible uh, against us, as it were, to prove their religion. Um, I'm not looking to disprove the, the Christian Bible. Uh, I'm not looking to find proofs against Christianity or anything like that. 
not my goal. I'm not interested in that. Um, if you would like to talk to me about that sort of thing, uh, we can have a private conversation about that. Um, but this is specifically meant to give an alternative narrative, uh, both for Jews to have what to answer, uh, as well as to let the Christian missionary know that, look, there is another way to view these things. Um, you know, it's not just so obvious from the Jewish Bible itself that uh, Jesus is the Messiah. You know, it's, it's there, there's a, a different way of looking at that. So one of the more popular ones is Psalm 22 by King David. Uh, now, Psalm 22 is uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful chapter of Tehillim, of Psalms, um, where King David is uh, speaking uh, as he's, uh, you know, being uh, chased by, by King Saul, uh, and he's, he's really feeling the squeeze, and he, he has a lot of imagery, a lot of animal imagery. Um, of being surrounded by dogs and lions, you know, the mouth of a lion and the bulls goring and dogs barking and biting, all these kinds of, you know, a lot of animal imagery. And there's one verse in particular, uh, and I will read it. Uh, he says over here, for dogs have surrounded me, a pack of evildoers has enclosed me. This is, I apologize, Psalm 22, 17. Uh, it might be, um, it might be verse uh 16 perhaps in uh christian bibles because sometimes the the way they number the verses is different uh, for dogs have surrounded me pack of evildoers has enclosed me ka'ari they are at my hands and feet now this word ka'ari is what we're going to focus on because this is the main point of contention here now the way that many christian bibles will translate this uh is they have pierced my hands and feet now, you can obviously imagine why the Christian missionary would love that verse um, and why many Christian editions of the Bible have translated as such. I will say, to their credit, many Christian Bibles that are current nowadays uh, have changed this, um, or at least they'll add a footnote. Um, I remember in my life prior to this one, when I was involved in a lot of uh, Christian activity. I, I saw this. I had a, I believe it was a revised standard version of, of the uh, uh, Bible. And I saw this verse. Naturally, it jumped out at me. Uh, and there was a footnote there. And it had a footnote for different languages because, you know, they use the Syriac and so on, uh, various different uh, languages, Greek. And so I looked at the footnote and said, in the Hebrew, it means like a lion. And I thought, well, that's strange. I mean, it was written in Hebrew, so if that's what the Hebrew said, why why would you use something different? Um, it didn't, you know, make me drop the whole Christian thing, but uh, it, it did plant a seed of, hey, that's a bit odd. Um, now, you always can tell what people think of you by what they're willing to accuse you of. Uh, Jews will say, yes, that's exactly what it means. Ka'ari, the ka, the, the ka from the beginning means like or as. Ari is a lion, or Arie, another way of saying lion. And in fact, in this psalm, as I mentioned, there's a lot of animal imagery. It just really fits. There's, there's basically there's three basic arguments against this concept that Ka'ari means pierced. Um, oh, what I mean by they'll accuse you of <clears throat> is that many missionary uh, apologists will say, well, the Jews changed the meaning of the word because, you know, it seemed a little too... Uh, it proved too much. So basically saying that we lie about our own Bible, I find that a little bit nefarious. I don't particularly appreciate that argument. Uh, however, uh, there's three basic arguments against this uh, this uh, mistranslation. And I'll go from weak to strong. Uh, the weakest one is it just doesn't fit with this. It doesn't fit with the theme. What do you mean? I mean, he's talking about bulls and dogs and lions and all this kind of stuff. And then in the middle of all this, he just switches to pierced like out of nowhere. It's just so odd. Now, that's, like I said, a pretty weak argument, um, but it is there nonetheless. It really just does not fit with the entire motif of this psalm. Now, another one, uh, another argument is that if you look at 
uh, other places it, within this psalm itself. It uses the word arie, like I said, ari, arie means lion. Uh, you have in Psalm 17, verse uh, 12 or 13, 11, it depends what uh, you need, the Christian Bible or, or the Jewish Bible they're using, because the numbering can sometimes be a little bit different. Um, over there, it says uh, ka-arie, which is similar. Uh, the cuff in the beginning means like, arie means lion. Uh, now, it's not ka-ari, it's k-arie. So it is a little bit different. So this is like the middle argument. It's a similar word uh, translated, even in Christian Bibles, like a lion. That's the second level argument. Remember, first level argument just doesn't fit with the motif. Second level, you see a very similar word just a few Psalms back in 17 verse uh, in the Hebrew Bible. That would be verse um, 12 uh, in the Christian Bible. I believe that would be verse 11. So that would be the second argument. Now, strongest argument, of course, is could we find a word that is exactly the same? Ha-ha! Of course we can! Now, it doesn't always happen. You don't always get that lucky. Um, but usually you do. There's a lot of words in the Bible. You may not... I'm sure you're aware. If you look at Isaiah chapter 38, verse 13, it says, Shivisi ad boiker. I waited until morning. Ka'ari. Same vowelization. Same usage of the word, ari, not arye, and guess how Christian Bibles translate it. You guessed it, like a lion. So in Isaiah, it's good to say like a lion, but when it comes to Psalm 22, verse 17, oh, that's when Jews changed the meaning of the word, those nefarious, tricky little Jews. So it's pretty obvious uh, it does not mean that he pierced my hands and feet. There is no reference to the crucifixion in uh, King David's Psalms, um, not in 22 and not anywhere else. Um, so I will leave you with that on the counter missionary segment. I'd like to leave you with a short Devar Torah, an inspirational thought on this week's Torah portion. We're reading the portion Vayechi, the last portion of the book of Genesis. And an interesting thing about this is it starts with the verse Vayechi Yaakov Eretz Mitzrayim that Yaakov Jacob lived in Eretz Mitzrayim in the land of Egypt for 17 years etc and Rashi comments uh, it's said there that he's the, these are the best years of his life Vayechi this is where he lived right this is this was a the the greatest most joyful happiest time of his life um, out of a hundred and 30 years prior to that, nothing. This was the 17 years in Egypt. Wow, that was it. So, notwithstanding his joy at seeing his family reunited and they are faithful to their traditions. Remember, Joseph, they, they thought he was killed. Or Jacob thought he was killed. Um, and now everyone's together and happy. It's a beautiful story. Um, it's still hard to imagine how the years he spent in such an idolatrous environment such as Egypt could be the best years of his life. And the answer to that puzzle is that we learn earlier that Jacob sends Judah, Yehuda, to set up a house of Torah study in Egypt before the family arrives there to live permanently. And this way, Jacob ensures that he and his descendants would remain immune to the negative influences of Egypt's corrupt society. And by resisting those enticements of Egypt, Jacob's children grew in a way that's only possible when you're faced with challenges. This is why Jacob's best years were those that he spent in Egypt, because it was only there that he could see that his children had fully absorbed his moral instruction and guidance. He now knew that this divine mission that began with his grandfather Abraham and continued to Isaac and now to him, that it would continue through his children and their children. Similarly, we find ourselves many times in an Egypt, a place of spiritual darkness. We don't feel connected. It's difficult to connect to God. 
or like Jacob and his family, through the studying of Torah, we can remain safe from that darkness of Egypt and reveal godliness even there. Shabbat Shalom. Until next week. But even if my tongue was sweet and lips graceful, I will stay.